afterwards I uh, leave you with Clemens. Uh, but service panels, and this is just preparing more or less the ground for uh, the talk in the afternoon. And Clement will show you some code. So what I'm doing right now is I show you patterns in an abstract way so that you can later recognize these patterns then in the code. Hopefully you recognize that. So, um, do I have to define what a pattern is? Is anybody in the room who needs a definition? Fine, thank you very much. Uh, I need this. Uh, the layering pattern, I think uh, I will skip completely uh, due to time constraints and due to the fact that layering in, uh, in the component oriented system, I think, is well known. You have several layers of application, one is accessing the database, one is doing actual work, one is the actual workflow, and then on top of that you have some presentation data. Uh, layer, sorry, not here. Um, in a service oriented systems, um, you could possibly think of, I have a layer of services underneath, <coughs> on top of which I have even more layers, and on top of which I have only a few uh, services which then <coughs> talk to the services underneath. Yes, you consider that. Can possibly consider that. I have one slide, let me show you, like this one. This is going back to our proseware application, um, this order service which talks to then to the order fulfillment service, which then talks to some inventory service, and then talks actually to the data. So I could now think this is one layer, this is one layer, this is one layer. Not performing immediately only business tasks, only workflow tasks, but actually both of it. But as you can see, sometimes these edges blur that this order archive service talks to something which would then be considered on the top layer or something like this, so this doesn't lead anywhere. So I skip this more or less. More interesting, and I think everybody knows that, what a wrapper for save is. You have something that looks ugly and you don't want to show it to somebody, so you put something in front of it, so you only have this nice save to talk to for several reasons. That can be. Um, it can just be that. Oops, wrong, wrong button. No, no, no. Um, to hide the real interface of something. That interface might be very, very complicated to deal with. Uh, it might require you to set 20 properties and then do an actual method call. It might require to call you call several methods in a row in a certain order and it might require you to call a method and re just effective from that result of that call go this route or go that route implementing a workflow so to speak. All that can be hidden by some kind of a replicate. A replicate comes in several flavors can only combine, just hide interfaces, hide parts of interfaces, hide the fact that it's actually you're talking to multiple subsystems, like my travel agent that I, I talk to, wraps for me the flight agency service and the hotel service and the car service. I don't even know that these three things ex exist. If he has something in the background that he sells the car, rents the cars by himself, fine, I don't care. Only thing I care is I have one interface that I talk to, I want to arrange a travel with you. That's my intent and how you do that, I don't care. So this travel agent then wraps the whole functionality of a subsystem to me. Most likely there will be some sequence. I don't want to care about the sequence. I don't want to just do a single call and then a certain sequence is called. So that knowledge of how the sequence actually looks like, how the layout of that workflow is, is built into that record of the same and hides these details. We'll go into the different flavors in a minute. Why do I do this? It's 
really simple to talk to them because I only have one point of interaction. It leaves the option to build a lot of logic into that wrapper. Ex for me, from my perspective, external logic. I have a client application that talks to this <coughs> subsystem usually, and it has to do this in a certain order. They can't be changed without changing the client. The client is a relatively complex thing, a lot of work is involved. If I factor out that control, that workflow, into a single service that I then talk to from the client by just doing one shot call, I have this control factored out into a single place. I cannot change it without affecting the client, without the client even knowing. <coughs> Eventually, I lose flexibility, which might even get to losing functionality. If ever I hide anything from somebody, yeah, that functionality is lost, obviously. You cannot get to it by itself, only in a larger package. I just do bigger packages instead of small ones. That's the whole idea behind that. Usually there's a performance degradation. It's quite obvious. It's just one call, at least one call more. I call it to that additional layer in between that rapid state. It just depends on how much time that rapid consumes. That may be relatively costly. One variation, the orchestrator. Uh, it's not an accident that you use a BizTalk schedule, which is the prototype of such an orchestrator. You would use tools like BizTalk or other workflow tools to describe a certain workflow in a certain manner, <coughs> whatever way you do that. Here you just draw activity diagram-like things, and which would then call all these subservices on your behalf. And the only thing that you do is you send a message to this thing, which itself forms a service. That can be then exposed by a web service or whatever um, <coughs> channel. We don't care, it doesn't matter in this respect. This is just one service implementing what I have factored out into that wrapper. A proxy, again, a variation of that same pattern. Just with a pitch that proxy, short for proximity layer, is something that is close to me in contrast to all the services being remote that I really want to talk to. If I have a remote service, I have to talk to him using some plumbing code. This writing of this plumbing code is usually relatively complex. Uh, you never write the real communication of a web service. Uh, most of you will never have done this. You have just somebody, some framework that creates a proxy class to you, and you talk to it using the regular means of object orientation, setting properties, calling methods, whatever you like. And this code internally of the proxy then does all the necessary things to get all these messages formatted so you can place on the wire, that you can do the connection to the other side, you don't care about it. That's done in that proxy. <coughs> of course, that can be a combination of that wrapper, the orchestrator idea, for example, and the proxy. Uh, in many scenarios you have this, in many scenarios like where crossing a bridge is very, very complicated. Um, you never go to New York just for a weekend, for shopping. Uh, usually you don't, because you say, I'm sitting in the, in the plane for 20 hours, just for being four hours there. So there's much, way too much overhead. So, and then do this, because in these four hours that you're there, you kind of come to all the things. So you go there on the next weekend again. And you need to be there 12 hours, so you go there three times. And instead of going there three times, it would be better to go there for three days in a row. But there might be some actions in between. There might be some interrelations between the things that you do. You first have to meet this guy, then you have to go there, then you have to look there. Maybe you first buy a jacket, and then the 
tie afterwards or whatever you do, and not vice versa. So you have to get things in order. So cross the ocean only once with a bigger suitcase, and then returning once with a full suitcase, a big one, instead of going there with a small um, bag to carry the things. And a proxy accomplishes more or less the same thing. There can be a server-side proxy, there can be a client-side proxy. If this is a client-side proxy, that doesn't apply what I just said. It's just a plumbing code for crossing the bridge going to one service. If this is actually a server-side proxy that you talk to, you talk only to that server-side proxy, or let your client-side proxy then talk to the server-side proxy, which is then orchestrating all the calls. So you throw all your tasks across the wire in one shot, let all the work be done, and then it returns. It's often worth to consider uh, building such a proxy on the server side because you don't have to cross the network so often. Do chunky calls. Every single int off scenario uh, is the same thing, where I don't cross a network necessarily, but for example, the, the gap between the managed and the unmanaged world. Same idea. Building a server side proxy in this case, like a component which an imagine just gets the call and then do the calls on all the unmanaged components, collecting all the results, consolidating it, and throwing it back to the client in one shot. Um, this is how it is in literature, very theoretical. Uh, um, I will only explain this thing. So usually a proxy and a service look exactly the same for a possible consumer. It doesn't matter whether you talk to your service directly or to a proxy. They look exactly the like because they are derived from one. Uh, it's actually using UML. I'm using UML in the Microsoft workshop. That's possible. And uh, from an abstract service, usually that is an interface, just the same interface. And the client then talks to the proxy, but that's the same as talking to the service. I will not go too deeply into that. You have that in your slides that you will get. Uh, I can examine that if you don't know that by heart anyways. Because I don't invent anything here. Not at all. Uh, why you do that? Several reasons. Decoupling my client from the location of the actual service. I'm always talking to my proxy, which is close to me, or at least in a particular determined place, which then figures out where the <coughs> service is. And the logic to which service to turn, there may be some load balancing going on, some failover uh, balancing going on, or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't care. I don't need to know. There can be some configuration which just routes my requests to that file or to that file. It can even be content based. You don't have to worry about all that housekeeping stuff, that plumbing code uh, that nobody wants to write. Um, you can even tell from the size of my notebook that uh, I actually, I actively refuse to look at Risto documents, for example. Um, I'm not that kind of guy. I really don't like that. Again, more indirection, but. As I said, if I use a proxy for the sake of chunky calls, I can even gain performance from that because it's one call more, yes, but only one larger, slower call and a few faster calls. Federators, next thing. I think that's, that's a turn that we made up. Um, there's a special, very special case of a delegator, and once again, a federator can be uh, even more specialized, which is then a partition. And that is, this federator is not talking to a set of otherwise <coughs> unrelated services, but to a multiple instances of the same thing, more or less. Um, this auto fulfillment service that you here see is talking to that inventory service, which then turns to the uh, actual inventory data. 
the idea that we had in Proseware was if I, I deliver from my inventory service, from the actual location where the inventory service is placed. And if this is now, how do the Americans call it, nationwide, um, if I have my warehouse somewhere in the middle, it would be a good idea, so I can minimize the average travel. But travel is a lot. So I have warehouses spread all over the place, one in the east, one in the west, one in the north, one in the south, closer to the people. They actually get something. So we'll have a situation like this. I have multiple instances of these inventory services, each with their own data, working on that. What's not worth it here is, now I get a cluster inventory service, a new level. I have now four levels instead of three, or three instead of two. If you look at this here, there's an order fulfillment service talking to an inventory <coughs> service. That was the original case. And now it's talking to that cluster inventory service, and it will not notice the difference. Because this here looks exactly <coughs> the same to the order fulfillment service as the original inventory service. It has the exact interfaces, the exact functionality towards the client. Internally, it looks completely different. It has now the logic to route the requests from that order fulfillment service to the appropriate site inventory service. But this is completely opaque to the user, to the order fulfillment service. Because this order fulfillment service doesn't care and has no way to know what happens behind that wall here. I can easily do that. This is one of the advantages of the real service-oriented architecture. Because I don't care about the internals of the other thing. I can easily change the implementation if business needs it. The all if that order fulfillment service is a service which is otherwise completely unrelated to the inventory thing, maybe this is an outsourcing company. This is somebody who does that unrelated to the actual order fulfillment service. I don't know how they conduct their business. If they can take advantage of having inventory services close to customers, it's their thing. They will change that. And if they have a fifth one, fine, they add, they add a fifth one. I'm only looking at that service level agreement here, you have to deliver within three days, that's it. How they do it, I don't care. <coughs> How would you usually do that? <coughs> here, all fulfillment service sends a request here to the cluster inventory service. We have these books that should be ordered. They are ordered by this client and he's living in this city. And then maybe based on the zip code or whatever, uh, there's some logic here. This request is routed to the corresponding inventory service. We can even have more logic uh, included here. Something like, I turn to this inventory service and I want to have five books of the new Harry Potter. They only have two left. Then I can do things like, okay, let's take these two and try to get the other three somewhere else. Or let's reserve these two and try, let's find another service, maybe somewhere else, where has all the five in one shot, and then release this, these two that are already reserved and ship all the five from one place because they're cheaper. Logic that you can build into that service and the rest is completely unaffected. Um, in Proseware, we have a different. Uh, we have two versions of this. We have this um, clustering here, this federator, and we have a special case of the federator that is our actually customer database. Where we say, okay, we have to store our customers in a certain database, but one database may not be enough because we are so successful, like Amazon, we have so many clients. All the customers in one database that may be too slow because I don't. I, I, there is no box that I could possibly buy who could deal with that workload. So I have to have several databases. And then I put all the customers with the uh, first letter in their last name from A to Z in one database and from D to F in that database, content-based. 
And then I have a disjunct partition of my database, which then means there's no overlap at all, and I can easily find, based on some content, in which of these buckets my actual data are, based on the kind of number that I give them, based on, I always look at the name, Okay, if that, that guy that maybe changes his name, uh, I have a problem, because then some, all of a sudden the data is somewhere else. Um, but additional problems for additional things. This is just a sophisticated name for a very simple thing, Ken already mentioned it, how to correlate messages. Um, it's in literature, this is called asynchronous completion token. Uh, some people call this correlation cookie. And how do I find out that two messages relate to each other? We had this in, uh, in Visi, we have uh, WS addressing, we have this relates to, where I can say these, these things relate together. Or sometimes I only have a request and a response. And this is asynchronous, this is duplex. I send out several requests to one place, and then I collect responses. It, maybe even in a different order. I don't know what the actual order is that they process my messages. Some might take longer, some are shorter, and I have to correlate them again. There's something in that message that is just an ID that cannot be there more than once, and that's it. Um, it's a, is there a con? Yes. Um, somebody might actually fake my correlation cookie. Just create responses with arbitrary correlation cookies. There, there might be some uh, case going on using exactly that correlation cookie, and I then proceed to that response. So I have to make sure that that response is actually really uh, from the same place that my original message was. I think Clemens already talked about these problems. Uh, pipes and filters. We don't have pipes and filters any longer. Um, in our case here, um, we have this in our fabric because then I can just go over this because I have much more to do. So much for the implementation patterns, now integration patterns. Now I have already all the services in place, and now I build something on top of that. And I want to now consolidate all these single tasks into one application. Um, this was already mentioned. I don't know exactly which context. I have several systems that I can talk to. Each of them have a certain way to talk to them. Originally, they all offered a certain UI. And these UIs have completely different styles. Uh, I, uh, I think that's what exactly that uh, notion that Clarence mentioned, uh, his girlfriend and their, his, uh, her four applications, they, she has to enter data. It would be relatively easy to build a portal in front of it, and just to present that data in a <coughs> convenient and consistent way, <coughs> collect all that data from that presentation, and send it down into the respective services. It should be relatively easy. For example, if you write an ASP page, whatever that is, uh, it's always a kind of portal integration already. It's that simple. But this is a formulation, formalizing a, this very simple fact. You can build on top of that additional applications with their own logic. And again, then distribute all that working load actually to several systems. This is relatively closely related to that portal integration. Uh, as I already said. Process integration, I have working systems, the flight agency, the hotel system, and so on. And on top of that, I build a whole process integration service layer, 
so to speak. Or imagine that the orchestrator presenting a completely new set of functionality, consolidating <coughs> existing functionality in a different way. Connection patterns, how to connect between several services. If you just call upon a web service directly, that's just a point-to-point -point communication. If you go through a central hub, and all messages go to a message broker, that message broker will then dispatch that message to its destination. Content-based, heuristics-based, load balancing, whatever that is. Comes in two flavors. There's a one-to-many communication like a public subscribe mechanism. One actually publishes an event, which is nothing less than a message, which is then sent to all the listening subscribers, which is a one-to-many relationship. That can be done. Usually it's shielded from you by some infrastructure. That can be done by sending message per message over the wire, or that can be just a broadcasting mechanism, sending the message to all participants on the network, and each of the participants that are interested in the message just grab it. And there's a so-called open communication, the so-called message bus. Let's so talk about that. Point to point, straightforward. <coughs> I have a direct connection between all participants in my service network, which means I have at least as many connections. Uh, that is then n times n minus 1 divided by 2 connections between all the uh, services, which is a lot of traffic going on, basically, across the very same network. And since this is not coordinated, what goes over the wire here, several communication paths going across the same wire have a lot of collisions going on on that network, which is of course a problem, because if the number of my messages grow, I will get actually a system which does, doesn't do anything but resending messages, which is a bad thing. <coughs> so, coming back to our proxy pattern, um, the proxy itself, okay, it has to be extended because how to locate the other side is not yet set. Uh, what we will have is a so-called broker. And the structure of a common broker architecture looks like this. That is, that the client doesn't talk to the service directly. It does talk to a client proxy, which mimics the, uh, this behavior of that service. Well, that client proxy doesn't connect to the server proxy immediately, but because it doesn't know where that server proxy is, turns to a broker. And that broker then, by means of some uh, knowledge, wherever that knowledge comes from, determines where the actual server proxy should be located, connects to that, and then that server proxy is connected to the server. In the dynamics, there are two versions, there's a direct and an indirect broker. And the direct broker works like this, that I am that th this broker actually gives a server port to me, back to me, to the client proxy. Which then sends its request bypassing the broker to the server proxy, which then forwards their call to the server, and same way back. So, Actually, this broker is just like an operator in a telephone system. Just connect the client and the server together, and that is no longer involved in the business. A indirect broker, they would send the message to the broker itself, which would then forward that request to the server proxy. This is more common, actually. Why? The reason is, um, why would I have a broker in the first place? Layers what's what's layers the obvious of advantage of having such a thing? Layers of abstraction. What? Abstraction. Abstraction. What, what is abstracted here? You have very well abstracted uh, uh, client-server connection. You can connect 
multiple clients to multiple servers and you don't have a, a tight one-to-one -one link. Yeah. Basically, you, you move from point to point to hub and spokes. Yeah. This is very good. Exactly. The one thing, there's more. Transparency of the services. Pardon? Transparency of the services. You can change them, uh, change the location and just update the broker. Yeah, well, I have this in both versions. This transparency. Uh, here, this transparency is done call by call. In this other version, the direct version, this transparency is in one time. This is transparent. And then, the next time, I'm, I can send the request to the very same server proxy. So I can actually establish a communication with that endpoint. I do more with it, just besides just sending it something uh, around the wire. Uh, which is actually the reason why this year offers much more flexibility. But if you ask people why they implement this, ever done it? Has anybody implemented something like this for this decoupling thing? Yeah. Anybody else? For load balancing. Pardon? For load balancing. For load balancing. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yes, you balance the load between all the server proxies then. I think most people do that. They have one point where all the messages come together and where they control, can control everything. Um, some people are concerned with things like security. You want to make sure that everything is checked. They want to make statistics, for example. Who is sending what to whom? And uh, therefore, they send all the messages through the broker. What is the obvious downside of such an approach? Performance-wise, it doesn't scale at all. Yes, not scalable. It's already, euphemism. Uh, it doesn't scale at all. It's one point of failure. It's one bottleneck. Um, you could possibly go around and have a bunch of these brokers because they are connecting you to any service available. You can turn to this broker or his cousin or his brother to the next broker. Who connected just maybe the same service, maybe another one? Of course, then you lose that possibility to have that central focal point where all messages go through. Okay, but that's intended then. Um, yeah, the brokers can be uh, in work, work together, so there are multiple co uh, brokers working together, uh, doing these things. A complete location transparent, which is the best thing of it, to be said. And especially the security management can be centralized. That is why most people do that. I don't do a direct call, so the actual call is longer. But since I use now you send my messages not all at the same time across the wire, but one after another, there's less collision. So the actual exchange of the message is maybe faster. And this very, very striking downside here, we have to overcome by some means. Oops. Public subscriber, I think that's a public subscriber. Very widely known. If you bind an event to whatever, you subscribe to that event, and sooner or later, uh, that publisher will then publish that event, and you, some established channel to you will deliver that event at your place. This is more interesting, this uh, message bus thing. This enterprise service bus, uh, and there are actually people who are selling you products that implement a enterprise service bus. At least they claim to do so. Um, actually, I actually have forgotten the name. There's one Sonic. Product. Sonic MQ sells Sonic. Yeah, exactly. Sells yeah. the ESB. Yeah. Uh, what do they do? Um, actually, what they do is they have something like a broker mechanism. And that is the version of that direct broker that I said. So you turn to that broker, that broker will find out where your endpoint is and give you a reference and will establish a point-to-point -point relationship with that. So from there on, you lose that bus, busness of that whole thing. You continue from with a point-to-point -point relationship. That's the only thing that you sell you. It's not all that much, I think. Well, sometimes it's freeware, so you can just use it. That's fine then. 
So, um, otherwise, message bus is something that is logical. The only bus that actually exists in that whole system is the network itself, where I can do possibly something like a UDP broadcast. That would be a bus functionality. <coughs> something on the wire, and who's interested gets it. But as we already mentioned, there are rare occasions where it's useful. Next group of patterns, I will have all of them in our uh, proto application, um, that is communication patterns. Um, how to do that? The easiest way to talk to somebody is shouting at him and then turning away. Sending a message, fire and forget, to a service, which is one way. If that is completely sufficient for you, if you are, can be reasonably sure that if I send a message somewhere that this message will arrive, so if there's some kind of or degree of reliable messaging in place, that's just fine. That's completely okay. Advantage. There's no need of waiting for an answer. There is no need of later correlating an answer towards your respond, uh, request. Simple. Not always applicable, obviously. Request response, the typical, mostly synchronous way, I send a request somewhere and will collect a response immediately after that on the same channel. All there is duplex. That is, I send a message somewhere to a certain interface and just say, if you have to tell me something, please use that channel, and I will await your answer there. That might be something completely different, unrelated thing. Not necessarily a message in the sense of a sort message. Uh, this is then actually summing up all that stuff again. So, yeah, that should be it. Oh, how many slides? Um, asynchronous communication usually done using queues, once again. Uh, queues are always good. If there's a queue in place, it's always good. You can say that. You store a message, you get rid of that message. If that queue is transactional, you can be reasonably sure that it will arrive at its destination. You cannot make sure that it will be picked up. That's different, uh, because that's not part of your transaction, usually. Uh, it's, the next transaction then on the service side. Uh, but this is the block that you use to uh, support asynchronous communication. This async forward receiver operation is this then, that is that my actually client talks to some message API, uh, which will then deliver that message into some local queue or remote queue, and the message processor, which has the same notion of the message, will then use some other message API to pull from the queue on the other side. Uh, and this is then how that actually works. Fine. Um, there's a lot of pros, there's a lot of, only a few cons. Um, you just drop the message somewhere in that queue. You're completely decoupled from the client working on that message. It may work on that immediately, after you place it in the queue, or a fraction of a second later, it may work on that next year, still the same programming pattern. It may work in that order that you place things in the queue. It may choose a completely different order. It may choose its own prioritization, uh, prioritizing mechanism. On your side, that you can prioritize messages, and there may be an understanding of uh, priorities on the other side. Doesn't matter. So you can shape this in a very flexible way. Um, I think the rest is relatively simple. This is, I will skip, this is just uh, delegates in uh, .NET. This is more interesting, half sync, half async. Sometimes you have something to be processed in an asynchronous way. But actually this is implemented in a synchronous way. So we have to have something in the middle, some translation of that notion of asynchronicity and synchronicity. If you do a call onto a web server, 
usually. That's synchronous. If you hit a website, that's a synchronous call. It will not be processed synchronously. There is no way of doing that. If 10,000 people or 100,000 people hit the eBay website at the very same moment, how could we ever process that synchronously? But there's an understanding of synchronicity on the client side. So they use that synchronously because they have to wait for the answer anyways. I want to see that page. So I have to translate that call. And this is usually done using cues. This is the mechanism. As the client talks to that asynchronous service, the service is asynchronous working. The perception of the client, in his view, that's a synchronous call because he's waiting for the answer. You have to think of that there's two perspectives. And then we just enqueue that message into a queue and this actually synchronously built service is then pulling that as soon as he can from the queue, works on it, sends the message back. And then the client is happy. He thinks He's only dealing with me. That eBay server is only talking to me. That's the impression that we have, we have when we're talking about service. But it's processed asynchronously, decoupled by some queue in the middle. And now, no matter how, how big the load is that comes onto my asynchronous service, I just stack it up in the queue. And if it, there's a need, I just spin up more listener processes, more worker threads on this side. They're all working synchronously, pulling something from the, from the queue, working on it, sending back the result. That's what they do. Yeah. Simple. That means, from the client's perspective, I have a completely decoupling of a synchronous programming against that system. But processing is done asynchronously. Because this is not much, this is not of my business how to do, how this is done. This is on the other side of the implementation of the service. Um, main concern that uh, I have to transfer the data here in an additional way, so I have to in queue, I have to de queue. Usually that involves copying a message. If that message is big, that's expensive. So, maybe not a good thing. So, uh, I think I'm already at my end, 10 minutes late, that's okay. Five minutes more. Oh, how do I fill this five minutes? Maybe with questions. Um, <laughs> pattern languages, what does it mean? Uh, Actually, I tried to use names for all of these things that are already out there. Uh, I didn't change anything besides the notion of these federators and partitioning. Uh, but I think these names are quite straightforward. So all of these things are already well known and understood. And like all these patterns, uh, pattern evangelists say, use patterns wherever it's due. Um, some people even say use patterns even if it's not due. I really would recommend the first one, that is, if you see a situation where you have that demand for a certain problem, apply that particular pattern to it. Because this is already understood, don't try to fix problems that are already solved with something. Like coming up with a new notion of transaction, if that term, way of doing transactions, already fits all your needs. Same thing. Any more questions? It was really simple, I know. You recognize all of these things that I mentioned here, now in this uh, Proseware app that Clemens will talk you through in the rest of the day. And, um, so I can now try to fill some five minutes, but I think I leave these five minutes and give it back to Clemens. Uh, so you may have more look at the code, because it will be fast enough, <laughs> I promise. Um, yes.
Yeah, I will finish now. But uh, first, I want to thank you for your attention. Because this was my last talk for today and the last talk for this year. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Uh, I don't know how many talks I did this year and workshops. Uh, usually, I do workshops, the presentations in the audience. So hands on when you do the things then. Um, uh, Doing presentations is simple. You stand here, you can talk away, nobody's asking questions. Uh, but if you do a real workshop, that's a completely different thing. So uh, now I will have my two weeks of rest. Uh, thank you for your attention, and maybe we see us again some other time.